Well, uh, go ahead and call this uh, regular meeting of the Board of Park Commissioners to order. It's uh, Monday, January 9th, 2023. Uh, we will start off uh, with any announcements uh, for the good of the body or for the community. Anybody have any announcements? Okay, seeing none, we'll move along to public comment. And I did not receive a sheet, but I don't believe I saw anyone sign up for public comment. So, all right, we will uh, move right along then into the approval of minutes. Uh, this is the, uh, the two meetings uh, that are up for approval are the November special meeting. Um, are we, okay. Uh, are, are the November special meeting and the uh, December meeting of the Board of Park Commissioners, uh, I will entertain a motion to approve those minutes. Why can't we make a motion to approve the special minutes because it was enacted in December 12th? Gotcha. I'll make the motion. Gotcha. Uh, so uh, Alejo makes that motion. I will, I will uh, second that uh, motion. All those in favor, please uh, vote aye. 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 All those opposed, same sign. The ayes have it. Uh, all right, let's go ahead and move on into new items for consideration. Troy, let's start off with a discussion about K96. So past couple months, actually about six months ago, went to a couple meetings in regards to the expansion of K96. Um, pretty, very interesting, really intense project. Um, <clears throat> it's gonna have an impact on some of our parkland, but not a whole lot. Um, but something that you guys need to be aware of, something that um, Actually, it's just good information to have all together. So uh, I have Mr. Jans. Troy, sorry, I should have spoken sooner and Mr. Chair. The K96 team is next door with two council members wrapping up. Could we okay. just switch the order? Yeah, sure. I can do that. You guys are ready to go. Great. If you wouldn't mind, they'll be in here momentarily, but they're not here yet. Okay. Okay. Yeah, not a problem. Okay, we can, yeah, we can go ahead and move in and talk about the Bleckley drainage project. <coughs> Not, not a problem. Okay, so we will uh, just go ahead and wait until uh, the crew comes in, and we can actually, even if they're a little bit delayed, we can they, come back to it. Be here shortly. Yeah. Okay, so uh, do you want to give any intro on this, Troy? Yeah, sure. So we have Ben Mabry from PEC. He's going to talk a little bit about this project. Uh, PEC is working on a really interesting project in regards to drainage in this whole area of the city. As you guys know, drainage is always a big topic here in Wichita because we're so flat. Um, and it's really going to be a proposal or an interesting idea that probably is going to be moving forward in regards to uh, Claude Lamb Park. And <clears throat> we've been talking about this for many years in regards to uh, a retention area in this park. So um, with that, I think that gets it going. Ben, is there anything that, that I've missed or anything that you want me to? No. Okay. Appreciate it, Troy. Uh -huh. um, thanks, everyone. Uh, thanks for your time. My name again is Ben Mabry with PEC, Professional Engineering Consultants. We're working with city engineering staff on the Bleckley drainage study update. Uh, as part of that, we're doing concepts for improvements. So you should have in front of you an exhibit that kind of shows the, uh, yes, that one there, uh, shows the uh, project corridor which stretches along Bleckley um, from Kellogg, US 54, all the way up to Claude Lamb Park. Um, it's, it's, an, it's a wide drainage basin through that area. And as you can see from the exhibit, the uh, blue hatching there um, is areas of flooding in the 100 year storm event. So it's commonly referred to as a floodplain. And so far, we, uh, as part of this study, have taken the existing conditions and updated the model based on uh, topographic field survey. So we have existing conditions and what we're looking to do next is work on a proposed uh, improvements concept and with that we'll have options for improving the stormwater through that area including reducing the flooding. So one of the questions is why are we doing this project? Uh, we're, we're wanting to create positive drainage along that corridor and reduce flooding, as I mentioned before. Um, and as part of that, it would likely include stormwater detention. And one of the areas uh, that has been identified for that stormwater detention 
is Claude Lamb Park. So that's really why we're here at this meeting today is just to get out in front of that piece of it and um, give an update of where we're at with the study and then also receive any input that the park board would have at this stage of the concept development so we can incorporate that into our uh, final concept. Uh, so with that, I mean, I, I think we can open it up to questions, but I wanted to keep it pretty brief. Um, our plan, again, is to come back later and, ha and have a, uh, I don't think, it's like somebody saying the meeting hasn't started. Shoot. Could that be... Uh... We'll just take a pause here while we're trying to sort out a... My apologies. No, it's all right. We're just making sure that everybody on the board is able to participate. So this is in District 1. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I just wanted you to be aware of that, Alejo. This is in your district. And um, this has been a really interesting park. We not have a whole lot of participation in this park because there's no parking lot. <clears throat> there's a basketball court. There's a playground. So we have folks from the neighborhood walk into this park. Some folks actually park in the neighborhood to get to this park. There's a large green space area um, that we maintain, uh, but it's not a heavily, heavily used park at all. So what we've talked about this in the past at other parks, um, as far as detention, it's always a good situation where we can have a win-win. Obviously, during major rain events, we don't have people in the park, more than likely. So if they can actually be used for detention, and then when that water recedes, it goes back to as a green space for the park. So um, we have been successful at a couple times uh, with that model in some of our parks. Um, so it's, as long as, from our perspective, as long as the water recedes, um, on a normal basis, it's something that's operational-wise is, is okay for us. So, just wanted to share that. Troy, what other parks have we done this with? I'm just curious. David? What's that? What other parks have we done this with where we turn them into holding or flood areas? Um, maybe Emory Park. I, I can't think of any uh, right off the top of my head to answer that question. Um, Way out west. Uh, what is Buffalo it? Park. Buffalo Park's got a drainage area. Yeah. Um, I'd have to do some searching on that to answer that question. Better. The other park that's near the golf course out west. Um, oh, um, the golf. Um, <laughs> Meadows? Meadows? Meadows. 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 That's the one. Yeah. How is, has it affected, I mean, like the neighborhood and stuff like that? What's, what's been the impact on, on, those, on those communities? I mean, the, like are you... The park has been very controversial over the years mm -hmm. because they don't think basically we're maintaining it good enough that we should bring in equipment and clear the creeks more, get the trees out of the creeks and stuff. And so uh, I know the... the neighborhood north of Meadows Park uh, complained quite a bit that we should be doing more to, to keep things cleared out. And then it goes on into, uh, you know, uh, Pontiac Prairie Park and to the Capskin and all that stuff. So but that park is a little all that starts backing up. Yeah. You know. but that park is really undeveloped. It's more of a natural feel to it rather than this park that is right now maintained as a green space. And so I guess is the idea that you're just we're just going to dig a big hole, or what's what would be the improvements that would occur? So the idea going in would be to develop a dry detention area. So, in other words, the uh, the the majority of the park, other than what you see over there in, on the west edge, is red. That's existing uh, floodplain. And so the remainder of the park would be dry detention. So it would only stage up and store water during storm events. And as the storm event subsided, the water level would subside and also 
so it's, it, it remains dry and, and useful the majority of the time. Did you, you build berms around the edges or how would you retain the water? Not necessarily. There would be some type of con control structure on the downstream side that would control the, it would meter the flow out of the park and allow water to store in the park as the, as the storm event comes through. So going out west, David, there's a, a Frisbee golf course in it. Right, right. Yeah. West Melbourne. Melbourne, West Melbourne. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, it looks like, well, it's grass. It looks nice. Yeah. It's got a Frisbee golf course in it when it's not a creek, <laughs> which isn't very often. Yeah. Is there, I mean, I know you said the majority of the park, so it, would the plan be then to leave the basketball court and the play places? Mm -hmm. And then have we looked at, like, I mean, the, the trees and, and the canopy, like, are, are those coming out, or what's, what's happening with those? Would that be incorporated into that? So we have not uh, developed this plan yet, but uh, as part of that, we would definitely want to consider the trees that are impacted um, and any other features that are existing. Yeah, I, I would echo that sentiment that I know that, that this board in particular is interested that if we have any impact, not only to uh, lessen declining the amount of tree cover, we want to expand whenever possible. So I think that would be um, something I would support and I, I imagine some of my fellow board members would be supportive of, of possible proposals to expand that. So if we're talking about, I, it sounds like a parking lot would be called for um, and possibly an expansion of tree cover. I don't know if there's any additional improvements that you might think prudent at this time. I'm wondering, the, the blue areas is where it currently floods on a one on 100 year. Correct. And is that public property? Is that, can be developed more, put in more trees or more walking paths or something? So the blue is, is more of the area that is off, off site and downstream of, of the park itself. Um, the blow up, or kind of what you see on the screen there on the left is, is the park, the shaded area, or the yeah. hatched with the black lines. Um, with right, the that's red. park property. The rest is city property? The rest is private properties and uh, public right of way, so a lot of existing residential neighborhoods. I mean, you can see on your top. Hmm. Do we have any further questions? Troy, who owns this park? Is that a park board or is that? City owns it. City owns it. Troy, what do we have to do today? Just here, man. Nothing. We don't have to do any action today. I think we just want to make sure that you guys were aware of this project mm -hmm. as it moves forward in design. Um, if you have some suggestions, I think it's really clear, an opportunity to clearly make those suggestions right now mm -hmm. so they can incorporate those into uh, design and, and decision models moving forward. So um, selfishly, uh, from the staff, we would love to get a parking lot out of this. It would be great. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how large, but Something that we can actually have people access this this area would be great. So I think that that would be a good win-win for everybody. I love the idea of adding more trees. Um, this is a good place where we can do that. Um, especially if it's going to have opportunities to uh, have some water there, and, and we can those trees always need extra water. Not that we're watering them per se from from the water area, but it just helps keep the area a little bit. Uh, more hydrated so um, but we could definitely add more trees in this park that's not a hard thing to do so on the on the kind of the structure and the taxonomy of what kind of parks we have does this qualify as a neighborhood park is that more under the and, and so I guess the, the suggestion I would have beyond our suggestions from the park board is perhaps reaching out to the neighborhood association if you haven't already and said are there any particular amenities we haven't considered because look maybe there's benches to be um that that could be potential or just i i, I wouldn't know as well as the neighborhood would so i have grown up i like we lived on 13th um like 13th and rock but i did drive by this park all the time all the time um and there's not as far as my memory serves, there's not really many other places kind of around there, um, and there is a there's a lot of there's a lot of people there, and so making sure that whatever we do, you know, 
I live on, you know, in Delano, so we're known for flooding. <laughs> it's really bad. So I fully support making sure that, you know, there's proper drainage, but I want to make sure that whatever we do, we do not um, hinder what's already there mm -hmm. because those guys really need to have a place to go and, and spend time and hang out and play and stuff like that. So I'm definitely open to, you know, hearing possibilities, but just want to really make sure that it's still beneficial to that neighborhood and we don't, you know, mess up, make waves. So just my yeah, a couple more things. So the playground used to be there down at the south end where the angled road, or it's really not the angled road. The reason why we moved the playground is because it was hard to get to it. You had to basically kind of walk through people's yards. So they moved the playground up by 13th Street there. And that canal holds a lot of trash. So <laughs> we need to figure out how to deal with the trash issue in there. So. I mean, is that something that we should consider if we're going to make it into a holding thing as well, if that's already something that we face out west? You know what I'm saying? Like, with it, like if. if so then we'll have floating trash instead of just. Yeah. Trash. So we've set it down river. Kidding, kidding. Cut it tanks in a way that it can be mowed easily, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, um, have, and and we, we start mowing it more often. Funding comes along to mow it more often, that kind of stuff. We should be with funding and the funding. Is getting funding. I'm sorry. Stormwater. I just said we'd love to talk about funding. And yeah. Mm -hmm. funding. We don't have any. Right. Stormwater. Stormwater is funding this. Um, two we items. Ask them for anything. Uh, we never ask Stormwater for anything. <laughs> <laughs> They're a good partner. Uh, two things. <clears throat> speaking of Stormwater and speaking of debris, I have a meeting later on this week and we're talking a little bit about finding ways to uh, catch more of the trash that's in our creeks. Um, there's a lot of different ideas and mechanisms to do that. Uh, whether it's bags around the culverts, um, screens that screen it, and then we actually have to go out there and pick it up. What's the, the difficult thing that's always frustrating is uh, we go out and clean all the trash out of the banks of the creeks or even our, our river. The next rain event, poof, it comes right back because it's coming through all the storm drains, it's coming off of the parking lots, uh, all the quick trip cups and straws and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> so it's a never-ending battle that we're working on and so we're trying to find some other ideas about catching some of this trash either at the source or further upstream and if we can do that then that'll make it a lot easier to keep the rest of the stream clean as you go down so um, there's no easy solution to that but that's something that we're working on just wanted to share that with you second I, thing is oh please go really ahead. quick um, so this, this is a little bit new here to Wichita. We have a couple places that do this, but in places like Las Vegas and Phoenix and other places where there's huge rain events that come and they need to store that water for a little bit and then let it release, there's actually parks, huge parks that are designed around this that they'll hold the water for two or three days and as it recedes, it turns out to be a soccer field or some other big portion of the park. So. This is not unusual, it's not something that's, that's not unique, um, but as long as the water recedes, as long as it doesn't have an impact on the park, that once the water recedes, we can use the park, I think it's a good win-win. Uh, thank you very much for that. I, I, I think to, when you were discussing about remediation for some of that trash, and, and you were speaking, Troy, about um, uh, mowing, is there any kind of consideration perhaps, and, and if not, then just move along without noting it, but for different types of, um, rather than just traditional fescue grass, but some kind of possibly natural grass, like native grass that can possibly be used to hold some more of that water and not possibly be needed to mow as much. I didn't know if that was something that could potentially bring costs down over the long term while mitigating some of this drainage. So that was my only other question. like Bermuda or, or you know, something like, uh, I like to say a native, but buffalo rivers. Buffalo, yeah. I'm not sure that, I, I don't, that's a decision you make further on down the way, but yeah, something that wouldn't require 
us to use a lot of resources to maintain it. Right. So I, so I assume you're gonna, whatever we do to the improvements, we're digging down into this area, right? And making a holding retention area? Potentially, we we you know without having I mean try without, <laughs> without having actually gone through the concept yet sure. we don't want to to say that's exactly what we're going to do but the idea would be to start at the lowest level and kind of bench your way up so the, the different flood events would would rise to different different levels within the park okay um, and then as as it metered the water out it would slowly come back down and, and be dry again. Troy, would this be like an opportunity if, if it's a park that's going to have, you know, steps or levels? I mean, I don't know if this is this park's big enough. I, I'm, I'm familiar with this park, but I'm, I don't know if it's big enough to have something like disc golf, right? But could you do something where, you know, if we build a parking lot, we put another cement slab somewhere and you have almost like a stage or a small little amphitheater that can be used over the summertime? I mean, just something that makes it more usable for the community? It might be basketball. Ball courts would yeah. be another thing for that for that area because mm -hmm. a lot of it seems like there's always basketball going. When yeah, mm -hmm. like always. Absolutely. Sure. Yes. St <laughs> st stage. I don't think so no. because we have yeah already enough stages that, and, and sure and it's a lot of work to do all that programming on the stages. Right. Things like um, basketball courts, tennis courts, um, pickleball. You, you said it, not me. But uh, yeah, uh, okay. Th those are cool. things that don't take a lot of maintenance right. for us, and Absolutely. is easy for people just to walk on and, and recreate on. And some trees. And some trees. Any further questions or comments? Okay, so, uh, since we don't have any action needed on this, I just want to thank you very much for your time. And uh, if you have any other comments for us, please let us know. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. All right, let's go back to item A, and that's the discussion about uh, the K96 expansion. So let's uh, go back to that. And folks, if you could introduce yourselves up at the podium, and looking forward to hearing your presentation. Mm -hmm. All right. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Paul Gunzelman. Assistant City Engineer. Um, KDOT has a, an improvement project along K96 from uh, Hillside down to 21st Street um, that they are beginning, have begun design on that affects the interchanges along that corridor. Um, with us today we have Jacob Borchers with WSP. He has a brief presentation to uh, provide you and then we can answer any questions you might have after that. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, board, for the opportunity to come present uh, today. Just a, a brief overview of the upcoming K96 project, as Paul described. Uh, my name is Jake Borchers uh, with WSP here from, in Wichita. I'm the project manager uh, for the design team. Uh, just really briefly, I want to touch on all of our project partners. This project is very much founded uh, and will be successful if we continue this partnership. Uh, Paul mentioned it is a state project, so Kansas Department of Transportation is leading uh, the efforts uh, in conjunction with the city of Wichita. Very much hand-in-hand, -hand, uh, city staff has been involved along the way. see a lot of company logos up there. I won't go into them, but I'll just tell you that our design team is founded uh, here locally. Uh, a number of our design team staff uh, live and travel the corridor on a daily basis, uh, so very much uh, committed to the success of the project long term. Uh, so project limits, uh, we are improving K96, uh, about nine and a half miles in the northeast part of town, uh, really at the I-135 interchange on the west, uh, extending south and east down to the KTA East Kellogg area. What you see in orange uh, is planned to be expanded to a six-lane facility, uh, so similar to what you think of when you see East Kellogg out there today, three lanes each direction. Uh, the rest of that south of 21st down to the south in yellow. Uh, traffic numbers don't support uh, expanding to six lanes, so that'll stay a four lane facility. Uh, we will be replacing that pavement all the way down to the south. Uh, what you see in the reddish circles are interchange improvements. So we're looking to make improvements to each of the interchanges along the corridor at Hillside, Oliver, Woodlawn, Rock, 
uh, Webb, Greenwich, and 21st. Uh, a lot of the traffic is getting on and off of 96 at those locations. Uh, so improving those interchanges is gonna help that traffic flow to and from the freeway uh, much more efficiently. So it's just kind of a, a vision statement for the project that really grounds us uh, as the design team, and that is we are improving 96 to prepare for and meet the demands of future growth in the city and the region uh, by relieving congestion, enhancing safety, and reliability. So at the end of the day, if we can do that, uh, you can see the benefits that this project is gonna bring to the community. We're gonna be increasing that capacity, as we've talked about expanding to six lanes, that relieves that congestion, we talked about those interchange improvements. It's really a big part of the project. Uh, most of the traffic here is not through traffic on 96 per se. It's really using those interchanges to access the freeway to get to other parts of town. Uh, so as much as we can get people to and from the freeway as efficiently as possible, uh, that really is a benefit to, to the region. If we do all those things inherently, we're enhancing safety uh, along the corridor, which is, which is a big part of the project. <coughs> Brief overview of our timeline. We did start the project earlier in 2022. We've gone through some uh, traffic and safety studies, uh, looking at some concepts that we've developed, um, and it's really started a community engagement campaign. We've been out uh, meeting with community members, getting their feedback, uh, getting their input on the project. A lot of the last few months has been spent uh, developing some of those concept designs at the interchanges that we talked about. Uh, in partnership with city staff, uh, KDOT staff, to develop those concepts and really evaluate uh, those from uh, a traffic perspective, how do they handle traffic, uh, from a safety perspective, not just cars and trucks, but pedestrians and bicyclists as well. Uh, what are the impacts to properties? Uh, what are the environmental impacts to trails, uh, parkland along the, way, along the route? Uh, and then from a cost perspective. <coughs> So we've gone through that process um, and we've uh, kind of come to uh, a handful of solutions at the interchanges that we'll be taking out to the public uh, in early February at that first community open house to get public feedback uh, on those potential design solutions. Uh, really wanna focus today on uh, the parks and trails along the project corridor. Uh, uh, obviously, you can see here a, a large map of the northeast part of town. Uh, what's shown in yellow uh, is the K96 project limits. Uh, and then what's shown in green, those green lines are uh, bike trails uh, along the project limits. Uh, you can see Redbud uh, just south of 21st. Obviously, that continues east and to the west of what's shown on the map. Uh, and then the K96 trail that really parallels 96. Uh, for the majority of the project limits. <laughs> Got a handful of city parks uh, along the corridor as well, uh, primarily on the western side. We do have Stryker uh, Sports Complex out there at Greenwich. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, just one thing to note, uh, you know, with the trail paralleling 96, uh, any impacts to those trails that would be uh, as a result of the project would be mitigated. So if, if we're impacting that, we're replacing that trail in kind uh, to make sure that we're uh, maintaining that connectivity uh, along the routes. I wanna focus today on the Woodlawn interchanges uh, and the potential impacts to Chisholm Creek Park. Uh, that's probably uh, the opportunities for the largest uh, impacts to, to city park property. Uh, like I said, we've developed a couple different concepts uh, that we're proposing to take to the public in, in a few weeks. Uh, the first one you can see here uh, is what we call a diverging diamond interchange. Um, so a little bit of orientation to the map here. Uh, Woodlawn Boulevard uh, in the middle there, left to right. Uh, north is to your left on the map. Uh, 96 there in the middle uh, runs up and down. Um, I won't get too much into the traffic operations of a diverging diamond. Uh, we can talk more about that if you have questions or we'll definitely get into it at the open house. Uh, but just to say here that we've looked at a number of concepts, a uh, number of opportunities, um, and the DDI really does have the smallest footprint uh, and the smallest potential impacts to the park. You can see some potential impacts along the west side of Woodlawn, along the park, both north and south of 96. 
uh, and then along 96 itself just to the south of the proposed off ramps. You can see in the blue, um, the blue represents uh, sidewalks uh, and potential multi-use paths. Uh, you can see on the, on the park property, uh, you can see the existing trail there. Uh, there's a, a blue section there that would get replaced uh, due to impacts to the expansion of Woodlawn. Um, one thing we're excited about, even though we are impacting prop park property to the north here, is we're extending that bike trail to the north through the interchange uh, to really connect those two park properties uh, and enhance that connectivity uh, between the two. So this is, this is the first alternative we're looking at. The second one here is very similar. It's called a displaced left turn, a DLT. Again, I won't talk too much about the traffic operations of it. Um, just to say here, the impacts, potential impacts to park property uh, are very similar to what you saw in the previous one. Um, the DDI has, is slightly less. Uh, they're both about the same, both along Woodlawn and 96 proper. Uh, one thing as we get into the environmental process here in a few months, uh, we'll be taking a look at um, any threatened, threatened or endangered species that may be habitating in the park, uh, making sure we're mitigating any potential impacts uh, and handling those things properly. So, so those are the, the two potential design alternatives we're looking at. Uh, and really as we move forward uh, with the city, uh, with the park board, with state partnership, as we talked about, is really the key to the success of this project. Uh, our design team is working diligently to minimize the impacts to park property. Um, we talked about any impacts to those trails uh, would get mitigated. So we're gonna be maintaining uh, and even enhancing that trail connectivity north-south uh, along Woodlawn, connecting that to the north part of that property. Because uh, Chisholm Creek Park has received some federal funding in the past, uh, we have a very regimented process that we need to go through uh, for environmental clearances with this transportation project. Uh, that's really good, that means um, we're not just coming through and blowing through and taking out whatever we want to take out. You know, we're very much working with, with the U.S. partners, with the city staff, uh, and with the federal regulations uh, to make sure that we're handling things appropriately and mitigating any potential impacts uh, to the property. At the end of the day, when we're looking at environmental clearance, uh, one thing that goes a long way with that uh, is a letter of concurrence. So hopefully as we work through this partnership with you over this coming months, uh, you would feel comfortable writing that letter of concurrence, providing us concurrence with our design options and any mitigation strategies uh, that would come out of that. So that's our end goal uh, at the end of the day. Uh, real briefly, next steps. Uh, we talked about that open house coming February 2nd. Also in February, we are officially beginning our environmental review process. So once we start that, we've got 12 months to get through that process and get that environmental clearance. Uh, so we'll be working hard with those uh, mitigation strategies uh, and those other studies that, that are part of that for the coming year. Uh, we'll be working through uh, preliminary design uh, towards another open house next summer uh, with the preferred alternative that comes out of uh, the concept development in the open house. Uh, we talked about the environmental process would be completed uh, by next January, uh, and then we're targeting construction beginning in early 2026. Talked briefly about uh, community engagement. That's really uh, a key piece of this project. Uh, we've done a lot of work out in the community to date that's going to continue through the design process into construction. You see here uh, a number of ways that the public can reach out to us as a design team. We've got a project website. You can get on there and sign up for regular uh, updates. Uh, you can click on the Get Involved button, uh, sign up for those updates. You can also go in there and provide comments directly to us as a design team uh, about the process, your concerns, your thoughts, any of those things. Uh, if you prefer, we do have a project phone number, email that comes right to us on the design team. Uh, incorporate those comments and, and review that as we're going through the, the design process. That was a really brief, high-level overview of the upcoming project. Uh, 
Uh, we'll continue to be in concert uh, and work uh, diligently with city staff, with Troy, uh, and with you on the park board as we continue to refine the design and the concepts uh, to make sure that we're addressing any concerns. But uh, with that, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, do we have any uh, questions or comments for our guest? Tom, can you go back to one of the maps? Um, I, I use this park a lot. I walk a lot there. We do bird watching there. And I'm concerned about the drainage that comes off of the freeway and all the trash that winds up in those creeks that are there. That, that seems to be one of the trashiest parks that we've got, it's, at least from the one that I look at. Um, is there some way, we, referring to what Troy said earlier about keeping trash out of those creeks from the freeway or from the construction areas there? I mean, as far as construction itself goes, uh, there's there's a lot of regulations that the contractor would have to go through during the construction process. Uh, post construction, um, I mean, at this point, you know, we're early on in the design process. So if there's uh, the concerns that you have, we can have those discussions. Potentially, that's part of the mitigation process that we go through uh, this entire process. Some way to keep the trash out or block it from washing down those streams, as well as runoff from the freeway is what I'm concerned about. Certainly. Mm -hmm. Is there a representation of where, because I mean, I've driven 96 quite a bit, but I've never, if I don't just stop and take inventory of where the parks are actually at, mm -hmm. where, what part, how much park are we losing on each side? Like, is that what the blue line is? Or no, that was walk, walkway. Yeah. So how, much, how much park are we actually losing? We're a little bit too early in the process to have uh, a true number of impacted acres. Uh, again, we're just at the concept stage. Um, a, good, a good rule of thumb is where the blue sidewalk is, is essentially the right of way line. So that where that blue is could be the, the new right of way for the street. Uh, so anything between that and Woodlawn uh, would be lost parkland. What, what about um, like parking and accessibility? So like right now, if I'm looking at it correctly, I don't know what that green dot is, but is that a median? And if so, then are people on the north side of Woodlawn gonna be able to access that park? And then are we, how are we gonna are we gonna move the park? Like, does the parking lot need to move? Mm. Yeah, so, so the green along Woodlawn is a raised median. Um, the, blue, the blue line represents that new trail, and, and you can follow the trail mm -hmm. north to south. It does go through the interchange, so there is that connectivity north to south. Uh, as far as that existing park parking lot is on the north, uh, yes, clearly that's being impacted with these concepts that lost parking would be mitigated, either expanding that parking lot or, or something to that effect. And, and I guess, so people wouldn't be able to turn from the, like if you're going east on Woodlawn, then they wouldn't be able to hang a left into the park. Yeah. They'd have to go do a U-turn or come back somewhere? Uh, yes, with this concept, if you're traveling north on Woodlawn, you would not mm -hmm. be able to turn left into that parking lot. Okay. Correct. And you said that there was, um, have you already had community engagement or is that just a projected like you guys are going to have that open? We've already started that. Uh, the website is up and running. We've had a number of comments already come through the website. Uh, we've been out. We've presented to DABS 1 and 2. Uh, we were out at District 2 breakfast in November. Uh, uh, Liz and I were out at Walmart at 21st and Rock Saturday morning uh, with a poster and said, hey, we've got an open house coming, uh, just giving them uh, a heads up that the project is coming and now is the time to provide feedback and we want that input now as we're early on in the design stage before these final decisions get made. So I can understand you're probably going to have feedback on a lot of different aspects. But have you had or do you um, remember any feedback specific to the park area that will be affected? Nothing to the park itself. There has been a number of concepts about, or excuse me, a number of concepts uh, related to the trails, bike connectivity, how important it is, uh, making sure we maintain the trail connections uh, throughout the corridor. And you mentioned <coughs> you were going to um, the parts that you affect as far as the paths go, you were going to, you know, replace them. 
are you going to do the same thing as far as the parking goes? Are you going to replace the parking as well that's going to be affected? Yes, that would be part of that mitigation strategy. And, and then any trees that get taken? Uh, working through what those mitigations would be for the trees. Uh, obviously, there will be trees impacted. Uh, whether or not those, I don't, not sure what the details would be as far as uh, what the mitigation or replacement of trees would look like. We love trees. Hmm. Yeah, our, our, we represent the trees. Yes, <laughs> kind of yes. Represent the tree trees. people. Yes. yes, we would ask that they be replaced. I mean, yeah, honestly, just to be upfront with you, that's going to be a conversation that's going to get brought up from the public that. Trees keep getting cut down and they aren't getting replaced. And so I think that that would be something that would be um, of the utmost importance to the community. Just to, if that's something that y'all just want to earmark, like we're going to replace the trees, that makes the conversations a lot easier. Noted. Or, or better, a, a, again, an expansion. This, is the this being such a large regional park, I think, provides the opportunity for, for that, that canopy. And I think a lot of folks would welcome that thought. Troy? So just in regards to trees, what we're working on other areas is it's not necessarily a replacement tree for tree because a large tree uh, is more valuable than a brand new tree. Right. Yep. So I just wanted you guys to know that. So if and when the request comes for the replacement of the trees, it's not just a one for one, it's a representation right. of what that tree value is. Mm -hmm. right. Any chance we can get that parking lot paid? It's a dirt parking lot right now, and that would be a huge enhancement if we got paid. That will... <laughs> we need your answer now. <laughs> <laughs> that decision will come through the negotiation process. Right. We'll put it that way. Uh, I know there's, there's, a lot of, expand, we just there's a lot of fishing that goes on there, mm -hmm. too. So, <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, you know, on that on that issue, I mean, I, I think that, again, this is one of the, especially for District 2 and across the entire city, this is a destination park. This is a major regional attraction for Wichita. It has a lot of really important features to it. Um, you know, when you're talking about easing congestion and looking long term, one thing that I, I think would be a, a long term way to look at this and also is, is one of our values of access. Uh, I think considering that this is already a, a major bike destination, this is hopefully improving walkability, I think as we're looking to replace parking, this might be an opportunity to look at what our transit options are. Is there possibly something that we could consider that could be an intermodal station of sorts that could make sense for a whole bunch of different communities that might not always get access to this wonderful park because they don't have bus access all the time or a protected bu bus access, or maybe they couldn't get their bike there. Uh, and they want to take the bus to do it. So just wanted to flag that, you know, if we're looking long term, uh, I think that's something that, you know, should be part of the mix of the discussion. Yeah, definitely as we're looking at all of these concepts across the corridor, transit is a key piece of that. Certainly. Um, I think the, um, thank you for answering that. Um, are there any habitats that are going to be affected uh, that, that you can flag from here that we need to necessarily, because I know that's going to be a question we're going to be asked, uh, whether or not there's, uh, oh, should we hold that question? Or he is said he wasn't. No. I'm sorry. We're not quite far enough along on sorry. our end okay, to, gotcha. to have thank those you. identified of what's Sorry, thank you, what's thank you very much. Thank you, the chief, yep. for, for Troy. Just speaking. But you, but you might want to share your concern. Chris. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of marginal property anyway because it's right beside the road, so there's traffic noise and there's a lot of pedestrian traffic and other things along there. But inside from there, there's lots of nesting habitat. There's I see all kind of wildlife out there. Gotcha. Gotcha. We have an expert right here. So. Understand. Okay. So I'm Amanda Alessi, I'm the director of the Great Lakes Nature Center. Thank you for being here. And that's our upper classroom, which is a free park. Um, and so I walked the trails uh, with Bob Grass and Jim Mason, um, senior directors of the Nature Center, with this in mind. And there are um, monarchs that roost, not, that like, like Tom said, inside. Um, inside, so that will bring that noise kind of reduction a little bit more. And so our biggest concern was um, berms and trees uh, to block that noise of, you know, obviously losing as little of park as we can, but then berms and trees to help mitigate the noise, additional noise from K96, because it is definitely that noticeable along that path. And even so deep in the park where you can't even see K96, you can hear it. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Here that this design right here was was kind of molded to utilize the, the biggest loss on that north 
west corner there. So where that was kind of unused space, it was designed to kind of minimize everywhere else and, and get as much space from that little portion as possible. And that way, it affected less to the south <coughs> of K96, and then and to the north where the parking lot, it did, did less up there. And so that's kind of how we kind of narrowed this down, this design. So. Can we see that other as well? Oh. Just <laughs> While she's pulling this up, I just had a quick question. Um, are those uh, proposed crosswalks protected? Or are they? Yes. OK, they will be protected crosses. Yes. Then they're elevated, you said. Is that? They're not elevated. They're at street level. OK, gotcha. they'll be protected, actually. I see. Thank you. change itself, these concepts are, are very similar along Woodlawn as it relates to uh, impacts and access locations. So the only access to that parking lot is coming south <coughs> on Woodlawn? As it's currently shown, yes. Yep. And presently, you can, draw, you can make a turn, a left turn mm -hmm. across? Correct. That's correct. We have further questions? Okay. So we have no act, and we have no action on this. Is it just advisory as well? That's correct. And just like anything else, we always will go through negotiations, trying to find out what's a win-win for everybody. Um, but we wanted to make sure uh, that they were aware of any concerns. So I think it's important that you keep those concerns forward and, and uh, voice them as, as we go forward on this. Um, but yeah, we definitely think this could be a win-win for everybody. Uh, what I really like is. The addition of the trail that keeps going, um, that's an access that we haven't had in the past. So if there's some other things that we can negotiate, uh, that would be great. Um, we'll see how that works. So wonderful. Well, yep. thank you very much for being here. And uh, once again, trees, trees, trees. Uh, and we'll uh, appreciate uh, hearing from you as this process moves forward. And left and right turns. Thank and you. Left and right turns. Thank you. All right. Okay, so now we are on to uh, the third piece of new items for consideration. We have the results and a presentation on <coughs> park attendance by Katie. All you engineers, you should really appreciate this next presentation. It's all about data. <laughs> There's a lot of data that, that's involved with this next one. So if you guys want to stick around, by all means. Thank you very much, guys. So I have some fun data to go over with you because everybody loves data. Um, so that's this big packet I put in front of you. So first, um, we worked with PlayCore, um, their Center for Outreach, Research, and Education, the Data Service Lab. Um, they uh, use research and advocacy to empower people to create opportunities for play and recreation. And they've developed this community vitality framework um, 
to understand the seven indicators of a vital community. So that's what those seven items on the right are, and they're color-coded, and those kind of correspond with different pieces of information that you'll find throughout, the, throughout this report. Um, so what we accomplished is um, Playcourt chose us as one of just a few cities to participate in their pilot program to develop a mobility usage report. Uh, we worked with them to generate six separate reports. Uh, one park was selected for each of our districts. And these reports give us a bunch of useful information like how many people visited the park during a time frame, how long they stayed there, how often they visited, peak times um, throughout the year, throughout the day, um, and where they went before and after visiting each park. Um, and the very last page of this report is a methods report, and it shows just some of the information about how this data was gathered. But just as a summary, it uses aggregated, non-identifiable mobile location data, so essentially GPS cell phone pings um, that were observed within a boundary of, that we set for, the, for each park. A visit is detected as seven or more minutes within the park. And um, there's a few different graphs that show reference towards where the visitor's home location is, and that home is determined by the, where their cell phone pings most frequently between 11 p.m. and 5 a.m. Um, so here's just a very broad overview of all of the visitors we got for each year. Um, we went from 2018 through 2022, and this data does only go through November of 2022 because the data was pulled in December. Um, and just housekeeping item, the report has um, the park's kind of in random order, but I'm going to be going over it in district order, so there's helpful little tabs if you want to follow along in the report itself. Um, so just very basic to pull out of this screen here, um, the park with the most attendance that we um, looked at was Harrison Park, very closely followed by Pawnee Prairie Park. So I, I'm just going to go over... The fun thing about data is that it's really open to interpretation. So we're just kind of putting in some of the things that we noticed from the data um, and, and some references to what we saw in the data to come to that conclusion. So for Glendive Park, um, football was offered there in 2018 and 2019. During 2020, during COVID, we suspended that. But then in 2021 and thereafter, a lot of that football programming moved to South Lakes. So we can see this in the data because you can see some huge spikes in the monthly visitor uh, chart in September and October for both 2018 and 2019. We could also see that the most common time frame was 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. I'm assuming that was when practices were held. Um, after Wichita, for all of our reports, Wichita obviously was the most frequented home location. Most of our park uh, visitation does come locally. However, the next most represented cities were Kingman and Oklahoma City, um, which was really interesting because it was the only park that had a like top three from another state. Um, and then 8% of the attendance was from other Kansas cities and 5% came from out of state. So kind of showing that people came here to participate most logically in this programming. Um, even without the football programming, we can see that regular usage is still increasing. Um, there's a heat map in there that shows a lot of the traffic at both the fields and the playground. So we can logically assume that people are still using this park regularly for the playground. And um, the monthly average visits, when you exclude those peak seasons during football, um, it's higher now than it was five years ago. So it's still, it's still increasing even taking in that, that initial decrease from removing the programming. Uh, moving along to Harrison Park, uh, the biggest thing we took away from this was the huge impact that adding the dog park had. So we added that in 2019, and it drastically increased the usage of the park and the visibility that people in the area have knowing about this park now. So from 2018 to 2019, visits doubled. And then from 2019 to 2020, it doubled again. So quadruple the attendance just logically from adding that dog park. The heat map also shows the, the dog pens is where visitation is concentrated. And then and we did <coughs> see the most visits out of the six parks we reported on where it was at Harrison. Um, so logically, we want to put more dog parks across the city. Um, you can see that. Uh, from, from the heat map of where their home locations are, most of the visitation comes from the area immediately around Harrison Park. So if we can 
if we can take that and transfer it to different parts throughout the city, then it'll increase the access that people have to a desired amenity. Um, and we'll just give people more of what they want throughout Wichita. Uh, at Clapp Park, there was a noticeable difference in usage um, when we closed the golf course. Um, so there was a big drop in visits between 2018 and 2019. There was, it was pretty obvious that's when we closed the, the golf course. Um, however, we could, something interesting that we pulled out of this was that only 65% of the visitors to this park came from Wichita. 15% came from Wellington. We did some digging and found there was a golf league there. So we can kind of assume that, that maybe those golfers from Wellington have relocated to a different course. Um, but still, with only a year and a half of data, with the course being open, uh, and, and we're, but we're looking at five years, it's logical to assume that we're still seeing a lot of out-of-town visitation to this regional park. Um, we can also assume that amenities are pretty important. Uh, one thing is that if you look at the heat map, you can see that it's very spread out throughout the park, which is pretty unique. So that assuming that people are using the disc golf course very regularly throughout this park um, and they're you know walking the entire park instead of concentrating just in one area um, another thing is that uh, the most frequented recreation visitation destination aside from um, this particular park is that people visited the Sedgwick County Park boundless playground so that kind of solidifies our decision to add an inclusive playground um, that at Clapp Park as well. That's something we're working on with the master plan funding coming up this year. Um, and then events are also successful. Uh, there's a part in the report that shows the week with the most visitors, and that happened to fall on one of our candy crawl dates. So it's just kind of showing that, that adding that kind of programming increases the attendance at our, at our parks. Uh, Pawnee Prairie Park is one that really showed the impact that COVID had on our attendance. Um, just Pawnee Prairie is a natural park. People spend a lot of time outdoors there specifically. Uh, in 2020, we saw a 67% increase in visitors. Um, the week with the most visitors was March 23rd, 2020, when lockdowns officially started. So obviously people said, what can I do if I can't congregate indoors? I'll go outdoors. I'll go outdoors, I'll recreate, I'll walk the trails. Um, and, and get my entertainment that way. Um, and so the improvements probably also contributed a lot to the increased numbers. Um, there was a 20% increase in 2019 when we improved some of the pathways. Um, visitor count is still staying high even now as the pandemic is letting up. Um, and we did expand the playground in 2021, so that's probably also accounting for some of that continued increase. Um, it is a regional park. We see a lot of visitors coming from throughout Wichita, as well as outside of Wichita, 28% coming from um, cities outside of Wichita. Um, and the heat map shows it kind of spread out rather than concentrated like some of the other locations. Uh, Swanson Park, very similar. COVID had a big impact um, because of it being primarily just a natural park. Used, it's doubled in 2020, so it saw actually a bigger percentage increase than Pawnee Prairie. Um, week, most weekly visitors, April 27th, 2020, still near the beginning of the pandemic, people trying to find ways um, to get out and do things um, as lockdowns continued for another couple months. Um, however, with this one, we are seeing the usage decreasing a little bit in the current years, um, so we're hoping that the footbridge that just got replaced will encourage people to get out and walk the paths, run. Um, it is a little bit more secluded of a park, so we're thinking that with COVID letting up and normalizing a bit now that people are not getting out as much, but with this new amenity with the footbridge being expanded and replaced, that people will start to use it more again now. And then finally, Keeper of the Plains. This one um, was actually really unique. We it had lower attendance than what we expected and kind of the opposite effect from COVID. Um, so one thing that's clear from the data is that the fire pots being lit is a big draw. Um, most visits were recorded during the summer months around peak times of 8 to 9 p.m. 9 p.m. is when the fire pots are lit during spring and summer. So it seems pretty obvious that people are going there specifically to see that because it's a really cool feature. Um, the heat map shows that most of the traffic is congregated right around the base of the statue. 
so they're probably watching right there up close. There's also some informational signage around the statue um, about the history. Um, the, the site is more of a destination in addition to a hometown icon. So that's, that's our theory for why we saw such a big decrease during COVID, during 2020. Um, there's a 35% decline that year. Um, probably even local visitors hesitant to congregate even outdoors just because it's such a small area and out of town travel was limited so we weren't getting as many of those um, visitors from outside of Wichita. 36% uh, of visitors were from outside of Wichita. We had 48 states represented and 23% came from 100 or more miles away. So um, it is definitely regional and uh, I think this was the one that had the most representation from outside of Wichita. And uh, moving forward, visitation is still really high. 2022 had the highest visitation. Um, so we recovered strongly from COVID and are is still increasing even more. Um, so people are probably pretty eager to get back to their old habits, um, getting back to normal, revisiting old favorites. Um, the week with the most visitors was May 30th, 2022. So I, I just wanted to point out that was the return of our normal Riverfest instead of the uh, kind of revised split up Riverfest that we had in 2021. So that weekend we had the opening fireworks. I was one of the thousands sitting along the river to see that. So it's kind of cool to be part of this report in that way. Um, but yeah, people just wanting to get back to normal and Keeper of the Plains really shows that. Um, some of our takeaways, again, COVID affected park usage in different ways. It increased visitation at the more natural parks with outdoor space for solo recreation, decreased visitation at our destination parks, and when programming was reduced, improvements and amenities will really drive our visitation. So the more we can, the more we can make for people to do, the more they'll come out. And parks will really increase our economic impact of the community by drawing in visitors outside of Wichita. And I will answer any questions you might have. Questions for staff. Tom, how were these parks chosen? Uh, we kind of came up with a rubric to um, focus on parks that had um, recent CIP money spent, the money we spend on maintenance at them, the number of amenities they had, and we were specifically ruling out parks that had other ways of tracking attendance. So we didn't want to include anything with rec centers, with pools, because we can also we can kind of already track that in that way. So we were specifically wanting to look at the more natural locations that we, that we really didn't have an idea of what the attendance was like. And then we did want to focus on one in each district. Are there other parks you're interested in knowing about? I want to know about all of them. <laughs> <laughs> what's the cost per park or per study like this or who paid for it or what's the... So we were pretty lucky to <clears throat> get selected from PlayCore to be on this pilot. And so we had to pay, <clears throat> but it was a reduced amount. I can't recall what it was. Um, as they move forward uh, with their, their service, um, we still might be able to uh, add on to different parks at a discounted rate, we're hoping. Um, but we were so excited to be a pilot. And this data and information is really, really interesting. Uh, it can really be broken down a lot of different ways, but there's some things that are really, really obvious, and, and COVID had some impacts, and that was really interesting to see how that was interpreted. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that was really interesting to me is a good example is on page nine. Uh, you have the visitor demographics, and for me, this tells me that a good example here on the keeper, the plains, um, the second line there, the Hispanic Latino, uh, we had 14% of the visitors were Hispanic Latino, but in the city census, they're 17. And so what can we do to find ways to get them to come to this particular park? And that, and that wasn't all of them, right? So we might be under serving or um, not maximizing our, our leverages with bringing in minorities into some of our parks. And so that's something that, to me, this was a great piece of information. All of it was great, but um, at, we don't know what the cost is going to be moving forward, and, but we definitely want to see if we could get this data for all of our parks. 
I do want to reiterate what Troy said. It was really exciting being part of this pilot program because we really had a voice in shaping what this report looked like. Um, they had a general idea of the info they wanted to give us, but they did edit as we met um, to make it more customized. And so moving forward, what other cities are going to get is what we helped them to create. So like some of the graphs changed, the formatting changed, like completely like what the in, what information was included changed based on the feedback feedback that we gave them. So um, it, do, it did end up becoming a very useful report by the time we got all the little details worked out. There was three other cities, total of four cities that were in the pilot. And I think we were the most uh, impactful in helping them come up with the format and the whole process. So, yeah. Question for the staff: How do you how do you imagine like this report impacting like your day to day? Like, how do you think it's going to change? So, several different ways, particularly in capital projects. Mm -hmm. So, Harrison Park. Who put a dog park there? Mm -hmm. Pow! I mean. Right. We, and so we know that dog parks are needed. We know that once we do the west side over at Country Acres, it's going to be really interesting to see what that one looks like because right now probably the attendance of that park is three people a day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and once we put a dog park there, I'm sure it's going to just go crazy. So um, six people, no. Well, it would be great if we could count the dogs, but they, they don't have cell phones on them. <laughs> <clears throat> However, on my point on this is whether it's a... Uh, playground, whether it's a park, whether it, I'm sorry, whether it's um, a dog park, whether it's <clears throat> pickleball courts, um, the before and after attendance is really going to be interesting when we put those type of capital projects. A good example is, is CLAP. So we have CLAP here. We saw what the numbers were with golf. Um, and then as things morphed through COVID and now we're going more active park, um, we're seeing a different total audience, right? Mm -hmm. But there's still a lot of people coming and using the park. Mm -hmm. Once we put in the inclusive playground, once we put the dog park there, it's gonna be really interesting to see what the attendance is two or three years down the road. Um, but then it, there's all these other factors in there, the demographics, uh, mm -hmm. the before and after, um, <clears throat> uh, what cities were uh, represented in, in the survey. Just all that kind of stuff is just really great information. Um, also in regards to maintenance for David, if we were to be able to do this with all of our parks, we know which parks are being used the most, that's where we put our resources. Um, we will know uh, a little bit more about who's using the park so we can program those parks a little bit differently as well. So all this information has uh, a lot of great impact for both Reggie and for David. Um, in regards to programming, in regards to maintenance, in regards to capital, uh, where, you know, it doesn't make any sense to, well, you know, it just depends on your pr perspective. If there's a park that's getting no attendance whatsoever, do we put money into it? Um, or do we go the other direction where, hey, there's nobody coming using this park, so we probably shouldn't be putting any amenities there anyways, when it could be a, a little bit more benefit somewhere else. That's the question to ask. But this gives you more data and inf information to make those decisions. Any other questions? You know, I, it, it's, it does stand out to me that I actually was looking through each one of these. Each one of the parks is the, according to this study, you know, the, the attendees are wider than the population of, of Wichita. I mean, and that just stands out to me as like, we got work to do, you know, because it's a significant difference between the population and, and our park users. So. I don't have the answer to that. I don't know what you know necessarily on each one we need to do, but we clearly need to step up those efforts in a very serious way because there, there's people who maybe they just don't know the story of how great the parks are, but you know it's our job to make certain that access goes up. So that's the one one comment on that. But the other, um, and this actually goes on to I, I actually watched the golf. I, we'll, we'll get on to golf here soon, but we talked about the some of the cool and exciting uh, uh, improvements that are going to be made to food and beverage, and I, I think about. How, what, what's the potential for cost recovery in some of our parks? Because the number one thing it appears on most of these park studies is that people are going to go eat after they go into our parks. Uh, that's something to consider. Can we d drive people to some of our park assets that have food on, on hand? Uh, truck rallies or something. There you go. The exactly. So, I mean, I, that's, that's money, poten a potential revenue opportunity. That, that's really 
Good, I, something I forgot to mention. And for sponsorships, yeah. say we want to, for our um, uh, playground over at Clap, we're gonna hopefully spend $2 million on that playground. It's gonna be inclusive. It's gonna be over the top. Um, so maybe we could get a sponsorship from, I'm, I'm not sure, somebody local, right? And say, here, here's what the attendance looks like and here's what we think is gonna happen once uh, we put something in place or even after we put something in place. Um, maybe it's after the, the playground's put in place and we want sponsorship dollars to maintain the park. And we say, look, here's what it was and here's what it is now. A huge difference. Uh, we can do this with Harrison Park and I could go to one of the veterinarian clinics here in town and say, hey, why don't you sponsor um, something over at this park mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and we'll put your name up and this is, this is the attendance that's, that's going on. So um, whether it's food or whether it's sponsorships, there's a lot of different ways we can use this data. We all know that I'm um, very pro dog park, so I'm just <laughs> gonna note that I love that Harrison um, did so well and that the dog park was the highlight. So I'm just gonna put my two cents <laughs> out there. It. Of the dog parks. Yeah, I had the biggest impact. It was, <clears throat> I, I knew it was gonna be a difference from 18 to 22, but, um, and that was only in 22, it's only from January to November, the beginning of November at that, so it's missing two months worth of data there. Um, <laughs> that dog park is well used. Well, and, and it's nice for, you know, like I don't have children, but I've got two dogs. I've got a friend, you know, multiple friends that don't have children, but we all have, you know, we all have dogs. And so it's, it's just another way to tap into, you know, a community that can't use like the playgrounds and stuff without mm -hmm. looking crazy because you're an adult playing on the playground or, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, and I go to the one out in Derby, the dog park out in Derby, and it's, I love that dog park, but it's like, it's just another way to kind of tap in. Troy, is there an opportunity? I mean, I feel like with these, like, I don't, one of the things I noticed with the heat map, it's like, there's obviously, there's something that, like, draws people to the destination, right? And then they hang around those spaces. So, and, and you looked at, like, the food and the dining and how things like that, you know, change after folks, after the park. I mean, is there an opportunity for us to use our parks to, I don't know, like, host not even a food truck rally, but just like have a food truck that like at a park that Absolutely. we can rent a space out to them so that, I mean, to help with cost recovery. I mean, like even if it's just like a designated spot, like I'm not even saying a plug-in or anything like that. We've done that. Mm. But like at some of these other spaces that yeah. we want to activate, right? Like before yeah. we say, before so, we give up on a park. So there's a lot of different factors behind yeah. all that. So. Um, this is really dependent on the food trucks. And we've gone through the Food Truck Association to try to manage that. Um, food truck folks are a little squirrely. We can never really depend on them one way or the other. Sometimes they show up, sometimes they don't. Uh, they wanna go someplace where they're gonna make a lot of money. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk a little bit about San Antonio first and then mm -hmm. see how that fits here in Wichita. So when I was in San Antonio, we had food trucks downtown. It was mm -hmm. part of my downtown territory that I managed. And we had probably 30 food trucks through the Food Truck Association. And we had 10 different spaces. And they would take turns uh, at each one of them. Some of those locations made lots of money and some of them didn't make any. But they all took turns because they knew one time, one day they would have the high uh, revenue site and one they wouldn't. If they didn't show up, they got fined. Um, mm -hmm. it, it was really regulated. It was really uh, a very robust program. And I had uh, one and a half people to actually manage it. I don't have anybody. Yeah. So that, that's one thing to think about. Um, and, and the food truck uh, craze in Texas was, was you know, it, it was mm -hmm. one of the places everybody wants to get food from their food trucks. So there was a lot of opportunities for a lot of different types of food. Here in Wichita, we don't have that yet. Um, uh, and again, like I mentioned, the food trucks are, are hit and miss. Um, they change hands, and, and the other part of it too is um, we need a, they need to be a little bit more organized, and, and we haven't been able to really track that down yet. However, 
we have talked about this and we have this program out there um, that we want to do this a couple different ways where we've had uh, ice cream trucks mm -hmm. or, or folks that are um, uh, raspas that are, that, are, that are out there and, and we charge them a little bit of money and that money comes back. Now, we need to come find a way to make that a little bit more, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for, consistent and, and on a regular basis. But yes, we've thought about that. There's a lot of different factors yeah. that goes into it. It's not as easy as just saying, right. um, uh, hey, Alejo, go make this happen. So there's a lot of different things okay. that we need to deal with. You know, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. Chris. Well, yeah, I, I, um, I just, I know that getting food, I've put on a, a few different events in, in parks and food trucks have consistently been among the most frustrating is in, in terms of uh, prepping for, I mean, I, no, I, I love I, food trucks. I, it too. It's, it's just, it's, it can be very inconsistent. And I'm curious, I mean, I, you know, as we look at this study, I mean, and make recommendations to the council, I mean, what, what do other cities do? You say Wichita doesn't have that yet. I mean, would you, would you suggest a part-time, full-time position, you know, being the city liaison for the, I mean, I don't know if that's, there's that much work for it, but I can say it's something that rises to the level if an event is successful or not. Well, if you think about like the food trucks at the fountains um, by the boathouse, like they, there's clearly like a miss, because a lot of them do that and they show up and stuff like that and they do get a good turnout and everything like that. So it's like, what, what do they feel like they're getting at that mm. that we can't also duplicate somewhere else? You know, like what, what do they feel like, why do they feel less committed almost in, you know? So one of the reasons why that, uh, Final Fridays, I think they have them as well, but um, it's because there's a band going on. There's other activities going on. There's other, things that, that are happening to draw people there. Um, and so uh, the Water Walk folks, they're actually organizing all that, and I think they charge the food trucks to be there, or they get a certain percentage, I'm not really too sure. Um, but there's also a guarantee that these folks, these food trucks are gonna make a certain amount of money. So we have to create the activity for all the people to go there. Uh, that's a huge effort, that's a huge expense. Um, so. The idea of just randomly finding the right spots, finding the most populated spots or the most visited spots and say, hey, I have a food truck, go out there. And really, we're not interested in making a whole lot of money, but there's got to be some commitment um, on their part, and we would charge them a small amount to be there. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of different factors that goes with it. Weather is another one as well. Uh, power and accessibility is another one. Water, and, and if they need that. Those are all things that the food trucks are, are looking at as well. And how much are they gonna invest to be at that spot as far as their labor, their overhead, their expenses, and how much money are they gonna make? So there's been some great other places that have put four or five food trucks in one place and they call it a food court um, and, and they're doing really, really well. Or they're not, I don't know. But, um, those are things we can do, but you, you had mentioned that particular um, over at Water Walk, and that's because there's a, an event going on. There's there's activities for the kids and for the adults, and, um, I, and I do believe there probably is some alcohol there as well, which we could do that in the parks as well. Well, I think the Wichita has an amazing like. Um, I cannot think of the word. Um, entertainment. We have some of my friends are like really talented local artists. You know, tapping into something like that where we get, you know, a sponsored local artist or something like that. Or um, I was playing through my head. The other one that I've seen, which again, it's around an event, was at Napster. Those like pop up parks. Okay, well, is that something that we can move to a park? But then, you know, I, I do realize electricity and things like that. So, yeah, it's just, or. Then I also went to um, the farmer's market. Like, so I mean, there's, there are possibilities. We have to find what would be the most, um, the easiest and cheapest to pull, pull off while also being beneficial for us and everybody. So I don't, I don't know. Just be curious to see what kind of possibilities we could brainstorm. Yeah, you know, I, I, I totally concur. And I, I think that 
what, what the easiest and the best thing is just using the networks that already exist out there. Like, you know, of course, leveraging the, the food truck association. I know that there's a, a whole group, you know, you, you talked about local artists. There's a whole um, yeah, collective down at the Muse Meridian uh, who, who has a whole, uh, they got monthly meetings where they have people who are musicians. They, they actually, I went to one of their meetings and they had discussed what are the opportunities uh, and I, I told them to come to the park department and talk about it. What are the opportunities for busking, say? Like, is there a policy that we could put in place that, you know, if we wanted to have a food truck here, yes, we can guarantee there's going to be a local artist who's going to bring their own fan base, and if people happen to be there, it's a draw, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, there are networks out there, you know, and we're not going to solve this, you know, this is a huge, you know, right. discussion, but we're not going to solve it all. But I, I totally agree. I think creating the opportunities for people to create their own programming in a way to say, hey, you know, if you're a performer and you want to be here, you know, you bring your own stuff and get ready and we'll have a food truck on site, et cetera. And like allow the community to, to grow those kind of opportunities as well. So don't know if there's much to do with it, but just a thought. Yep. Uh, anyway, well, um, <laughs> I, could, this, I could just keep does talking. Does stay That's internal <laughs> now or you take it to city council or to the devs, districts or, I mean, there's a lot of real interesting information in here, and I mean, it would be great if we got funding for, to expand it. But Tom, I didn't hear the first part of it, but let me think. I, I think I know what, what you were asking. What happens next? Um, I would like to make this a presentation to council and share this information to council. Uh, I've been bugging the city manager about getting more data uh, for all of our parks, and um, so this. Is, if we go further, I'm going to need funding for it as well. So. Um, and there it is, the making the call. Just get <laughs> called in. Um, so yes, we're going to share this with council. Um, I didn't think about DABs, but that would be uh, an interesting presentation to the DABs. Yeah, that's a good idea. All right. And anybody else who wants to listen or, to this data stuff, um, uh, I, I was having so much fun with this project. We met with them at least a dozen times. Um, on, on a regular basis the past eight, ten months, and <clears throat> every time the report would come out, I'd get all excited and look at the data and stuff, and then they'd add to it or it, we would uh, rearrange it and all kinds of stuff. This, is, this was a really, for the geek uh, data person that a couple of us are, um, uh, we really enjoy this project. So if nothing else, at at the least, we have six parks that we know some things about that we didn't know about before. And we can make inferences from this about all the other parks as well. But next step is hopefully to expand it to all the parks. The next step is also to share this data and information with um, stakeholders and council members and anybody else. Excellent. All right. Any other further questions or comments? Seeing none. All right. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I'm running away with it, so I figured I should shut up. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, okay. Well, uh, next up, do we have a finance update? So, Brandon is crunching numbers. Okay. So, it's the end of the year, uh, so he's still trying to put some of that stuff, in, and we'd rather wait till February to give you a complete uh, history of, of 2022. And then we'll have a really good idea of what we are trying to accomplish for uh, the rest of 23. But we'll be doing the budget process for 24, which is even more important. Okay. okay. All right. So we'll defer that until February. Do you want to give us a communication update, Troy? Communication is going great. Great. <laughs> um, I don't have any updates because we didn't have anything to communicate with the, uh, from this body to the city manager or to council or vice versa. So um, I don't have anything for that. I won't put you on the spot, but do you have the ad? Do you have that ready for today, that uh, the rentals ad? That I, you did? I do, and I, this might be a great time to do that. Okay. Uh, Penny, you will cue it up and Very good. It. No, yeah, I, I didn't mean to cut you off guard, but I actually, we brought, I brought this up on Friday when I met with Troy. I, was, I happened to be uh, just browsing the internet, and I, hear, I was served a park and recreation ad, and I just, I wanted to, this is great. I was very pleased. It was, it was really cool to see, and I wanted to make sure the rest of the board saw it. Yeah, I'm not sure who from the board saw it, but this will also go into our YouTube uh, recording. So, um, yeah, I think this is pretty exciting stuff.
Okay, while she's queuing it up, uh, this video is all about our rental spaces through our parks and recreation uh, facilities and kind of gives a little bit of information about all of our facilities that we rent. So uh, just give us a quick little background. I just wanted to make certain we got a chance to take a look at that. So one of our revenue generating opportunities is renting out our spaces. And so we've had a lot of demand for um, smaller to medium sized gatherings, uh, whether they're weddings, whether they're meetings, whether they're just family get togethers. Uh, OJ Watson, and we bragged about this and we probably should have a meeting out there one of these days at the new seasons. Um, that particular f facility is brand new and it's getting booked really, really well. Um, for golf, uh, another revenue generating activity is rentals over at the golf course. Um, Auburn Hills is probably the most, uh, um, I don't know, probably be the best situation because of the parking and the food availability and those type of things, but we can do something at any of the golf courses. Uh, do rental spaces. We have, like I mentioned, we have over 70 locations that you can rent uh, big and small. So, um, yeah, that's what this is all about. Well, thank you very much for mm -hmm. uh, sharing that. And I wanted to lift up Shanna Applehands, who produced the video, especially. Mm -hmm. Our staff does tremendous work. This is just the latest example. So, I want to make certain I uh, share the good news about uh, uh, our department and again thank you to our staff for always showing up in a very big way to, to produce some really great results. So all right we'll kick it on forward now to do we have a social media update for this month back with Katie? No we are all right we'll move on forward then. I do have a question. Oh please go ahead. So earlier we heard from the K96 expansion and they mentioned that they were they had started community engagement and they have a survey is that the type of stuff that we want to see publicized on social media, like as the parks department, like, hey, y'all engage with this, and then as the board, we can share that from the park board or from the park hosts? You know, I, I, to, to echo that just while you say it, I mean, we were, I, when we talked about our special meeting, one of the big complaints was we didn't have enough promotion for that. So I, I think that, that this is an example of when we want to, we can put together some really nice social media friendly video products and, and well, know, I mean, just even the mm -hmm. link that says, hey, right. you know, of there's going to be, mm -hmm. you know, we want to hear about this project that might be happening in, in, your, in the parks, and then we can go in and share it. Yeah. Sure, we can do that. Sure. Okay. Yep. Good, great. I mean, if we want to do the videos, that's cool too. I'm yeah. <laughs> not against that either. I'm just thinking something quicker. Absolutely. Well, well two different things. One's an outside organization, uh, KDOT. Right. They're producing their own surveys and social media and videos and whatnot. Um, we could definitely link to those and people, because it might have some impact. Um, when I talked to them, we kind of looked at the total project for the K96. It's huge, right. huge, huge. Maybe 1% of it actually, maybe even less than that, impacts mm -hmm. our park. But it's great information to share with everybody, so we can do that. Mm -hmm. Um, this situation was, this video was a self-promotion of our yeah. opportunities. No, yeah, no, I'm just saying, you know, like if we want to see more engagement, I mean, and mm -hmm. hear more perspectives. Yep. I'm sure we're not the only ones that care, you know. But ultimately, those surveys uh, don't come to us. Right. Uh, the no it. numbers and the outcomes uh, will be going to KDOT, but sure. you know what, we can help KDOT. And then we can, that's a good point, then we can negotiate harder and say, we help get the engagement out, I mean, right? So they should, should owe us a little bit more, right? That's what well, I'm saying. Well, we need to make sure it's kind of covering our backside, you mm -hmm. know? So if, if we share their link for surveying and, and all that stuff, the our patrons who are gonna be going to the parks and stuff are going to be sharing their feedback. And so that way, 
hopefully we can prevent as much backlash that may be coming. So mm -hmm. I agree with Alejandro just yeah. sharing, having that link shareable so that way we can try to prevent as much uproar. Mm -hmm. There's you less... know, someone's always going to be upset about something, yep. but trying to prevent some of, some of it would probably not be a bad idea. There's less surprises and then we can say, well, we did our best to get this information out. Um, so, but this has been on, on K96 has actually been covered by the news a couple times already. So, sure. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so next, uh, instead of uh, Reggie's presentation on recreation, we have Amanda here. Um, she's going to give a great update on Great Plains Nature Center. Um, I'm sure she's going to cover all this, but it's one of our best facilities and it's one of our most important facilities, not just in Wichita, but across the state. Um, I think that our, our partnership and association with the Great Plains Nature Center is extremely important and has an impact um, on uh, so many different levels, but across the whole state, it's really kind of interesting. So, uh, and I think um, it, it's one of the most unique partnerships that we have across the country with four different agencies partnering. I'm sure you're going to cover all that. And if she misses anything, I'll cover that at the end. <laughs> thank you, Troy. I am Amanda Alessi. I'm the director of the Great Plains Nature Center. So thank you for giving me the opportunity to share with you today. Um, I did just want to give some background and, um, about us, because I didn't know um, how much you knew about the Great Plains Nature Center and this amazing partnership. The arrow? You might have to just hit the <laughs> I can just, I'm more comfortable with the keyboard anyway. All right. There we go. So as Troy mentioned, this is a cooperative partnership between um, four government agencies and the nonprofit. So the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is our federal partner. They own the building and six to eight acres that it sits on. The Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks um, utilizes one wing of the building uh, for their regional office. And they um, pay for the operation and maintenance of the inside of the building as well. All of these agencies and the nonprofit provide staff in addition to other resources. Um, and Wichita Park and Recreation, so I am the city's employee that is out there at the, at the Great Plains Nature Center. And the, in the city contributes to the maintenance of, of the parking lots and lawn care, as well as maintaining Chisholm Creek Park which is we're just adjacent to Chisholm Creek Park. And so um, the park department does a great job maintaining that park uh, for our use as an outdoor classroom, maintaining it for habitats um, for the wildlife as well. And the Friends of the Great Plains Nature Center is a nonprofit organization whose sole mission is to support the mission of the Great Plains Nature Center. Um, we have the common goal of um, providing opportunities for the public to investigate, understand, and develop an appreciation for wildlife and the environment while promoting sound stewardship of natural resources. So all of this is um, kind of defined in a memorandum of agreement that we renew every few years. So our vision is to inspire stewardship of the natural world through exceptional experiences to benefit future generations. So there are a few avenues um, that we get this done. So we have publications, uh, we provide resources to the public, programs, events, and our visitor center that is the building and the Coke Habitat Hall. So our publications and resources include um, pocket guides. These are, it's a series, there are 16 titles currently. Um, and these are available for free to anyone who visits the Great Plains Nature Center. You can go home, you can choose which one you want, um, and you can get one on every visit. Um, some popular ones are raptors and uh, Kansas snakes. Um, our Prairie Post newsletter, so that's a newsletter that you can sign up for and you get uh, regular updates from the Great Plains Nature Center. And then our GPNC, GPNC annual guide um, that's new last year, and it really was, the city played a big part in this. Shanna and Jessica uh, really helped us get this going, and it's, it's made a difference um, out at the Nature Center and, and our ability to promote our programming and things. So we're really appreciative of that, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, discovery boxes are another resource that we have. These are big trunks filled with materials and curriculum, and these are available for free to check out by teachers, scout leaders, anybody in the community um, based on different topics like skin skulls and tracks. We have two that are Kansas symbols, so those get really used a lot in January. Um, herpetology, we have a B1, birds, it's, they're really fantastic. 
And then let's go outside backpacks. I really want to promote these. These are fantastic and I don't think they get used enough. So you can stop by the nature center in the gift shop and go check out a backpack. And this backpack is loaded. It has binoculars and field guides and journals and bug boxes, um, all kinds of things to help you explore um, Chisholm Creek Park or wherever you want to take it. But you can just check it out for free, go out and use it and return it. And it's a really great thing, um, a way to help you engage with that park, what we do. Um, this is the bulk of what we do, our programming. And so we spent, uh, during COVID, so 2020, 2021, and revamping and evaluating our programming. And what we did is we took every program that we do, um, we even created several new ones but we tied them to next generation science standards. We really wanted to be meeting that need. That was a question that teachers were constantly asking us, what standards does this meet? What standards does this meet? And so we were very intentional in tying those um, programs to the science standards for those teachers. We offer those as field trips, and then we also have the outreach, and we are continuing to offer virtual programming. Um, even as we are able to do field trips and in-person things because we are regional and we saw that we could reach um, students who might not be able to visit the Great Plains Nature Center, we can still have an impact and get to them that way. Um, we also have an additional to those school programmings, we have regular programming, children's programs that are weekly or monthly, um, a drop in craft time, story time. Outdoor play is one of my favorites, so that is a time for kids to stop by. We provide materials outside and it's more of a free play. So it's less structure, less curriculum. Um, my favorite outdoor play, we had sticks and logs and parents and kids and caretakers, families had so much fun just building forts. There was, there was not a lot of instruction from us, but it was an opportunity to, for those little ones to engage and do all that. Um, and then the other bulk of what we do are events. You can see we have quite a list. These are the events that we are planning for 2023. We're in 2023 now. Um, so we're pretty excited about that Kansas Day celebration coming up in just a couple weeks. And then our visitor center. So the whole building um, has Coke Habitat Hall, which is filled with hands-on displays featuring the three main habitats you'll find in the Great Plains. So we've got woodlands, wetlands, and grasslands. Um, some really neat things to do. That wall on the right uh, where that family is, so that is a fur wall. So um, there's fur from all kinds of different animals. So when can you touch a skunk safely? There, you can there, even a bison too. So um, that's pretty exciting. We also have a 2200 gallon aquarium that is, has native Kansas fishes in it. That's a, that's a pretty big draw. Um, and behind that is the Bob Gress Wildlife Observatory. So no matter what the weather, you can enjoy wildlife with these beautiful windows and a couch. And we put up some books there, children's books. You can sit and really enjoy that room. So to recap, kind of 2022, we really spent getting back into the game. People were ready to come out and do programming. Um, we rebuilt our staff. So a lot of these programs that you see and our events, our staff had never seen our programs. They had been with us, but because of COVID, they had never done or seen these programs. And so it was, um, I'm really proud of the job that they did. So we had um, over 58,000 in attendance at our programming um, with over 850 programs. And that's a huge increase from 2021, obviously when we were doing very little programming. And with volunteers, we had a 13% increase in volunteers last year. Volunteers help out with trail maintenance. They help out at the front desk, um, greeting visitors as they come in. Um, they do a lot of help with us for animal care and during our special events. So looking ahead, Kansas Day is our next big event. This is like an open house type event that we started last year, was our first year, and it was such a huge success. Um, so we kind of pick our favorite things about the Nature Center that we want to highlight. Uh, we want people to come out and experience and we feature that at the event as well as our state symbols. And it's also when we launch our activity guide or our annual guide, not our activity guide, our annual guide. Um, so that will be launched on that day. You can stop by and pick up your free annual guide that has our 
calendar of events and more about our programming and different things that we do. Um, we are getting ready, um, have been working on this for several years, so building repairs and renovations. Um, this includes foundation repair, and so I have a statement that I'm going to read, so I'm sure that you all get the correct information <laughs> um, as it came to me from the Fish and Wildlife Service. And so this is the most recent information we have. Um, the Great Plains Nature Center and Kansas Department of Wildlife and Parks building will undergo major foundation repairs and renovation to the exterior and interior of the building. Due to the sinking foundation, there have been major cracks in the flooring, sidewalks, and walls, creating hazards for staff and visitors. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service has secured $11 million of funding from the Great American Outdoors Act to put towards GPNC repairs. Currently, the estimated cost is approximately $8,436,503. What is outside of that $8 million to $11 million goes to Quivira National Wildlife Refuge for their projects because we are under their umbrella. We are not a refuge. Um, we are not a National Fish and Wildlife Service refuge, so we're under that umbrella at Quivira. Uh, the project will include foundation repair on the west and east wings of the building, interior and exterior repairs of the west and east wings, landscaping for stormwater drainage and rehab of the GPNC solarium, or that observatory that I mentioned, and construction is estimated to begin late 2024 or early 2025. An engineering consultation and walkthrough is scheduled January 24th to continue moving forward. So that's the latest information I have from the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, we're so far out from this, I, we don't have dates and we don't have an engineering plan. Um, they have one, but it's going to be so long before they can get started, they're going to have to reevaluate that to determine if they can still use that plan or if they have to do another one. Um, so for us at the Great Plains Nature Center, what this means um, as we try to plan ahead for this, um, we want to get out ahead with communication on a communication campaign. We want to have targeted communication with the public, with teachers, stakeholders. Um, there are lots of, of community uh, organizations that use our building, and so we want to be sure that we're informing them ahead of time um, what the timeline is, what this is going to look like. The entire building is not expected to be closed at the same time. They, they have said that they will work with us to try to help accommodate what would be the least disruptive. That's part of what is supposed to be done. So for wildlife and parks, that definitely involves a season. There is a season when they are selling um, boat registrations or hunting licenses, and that they really want to disrupt that the least. And then as well, they're going to talk to us about what is going to disrupt our programming the least. Um, so we hope to have better and more communicating communication as we move forward when we have information to share. Right now we don't have a lot of information to share about that. Um, and we will also include with that clear signage around the building what's going on with this construction, why is it happening, and where can you go um, since we can't be here, what are we doing? We are also going to be working on adjusting our field trips and our outreach programs. Um, you know, I don't anticipate that we can't, there's no reason why we can't do field trips still. I mean, the, the staff who started the Nature Center, that's what they were doing before we had the buildings. That's what they were doing out at Pawnee Prairie Park. Um, so we can certainly carry on and keep doing field trips. We would just need to, as a staff, adjust how we do that, what, what materials do we need, can we bring animals to those field trips and things like that. Um, and we're also looking at where does our staff go? So what kind of workspace does our staff need? Yes, they can, some of that work can continue remotely or at home, but there are some things where we do need to meet together and then there's our animals. So the animal ambassadors that we house um, and take care of for our programming, um, they're gonna need a place to be and they're gonna need a place for us to come that we can come in and take care of them that's suitable for that. So that's what we are looking at down the road, um, what's coming up with us in the next couple of years. Great. Do you have any questions? Thank you very much. Do we have questions for staff? Or any comments? I'll make a comment. Please, Troy. So I just want to share the hard work Amanda's been doing. It's been 
hugely impactful, all she's been doing. So uh, the Great Plains Nature Center has had a great reputation for many, many years for all the programming that it does, the facility, that, and, and just the amazing work that they do. Amanda has to have, have to manage folks from other agencies, not just city employees, but state employees, federal employees, also work with the volunteers, also work with employees from their uh, uh, partnership folks. It's, it's just amazing. So I just wanted to let you guys know that Amanda kicks butt. That's all. <laughs> Further questions or comments? Um, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you for everything that you do. Thank you for your time. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Now it's time to hear from, uh, from Jesse uh, for an update on golf. So we'll let him get set up here. All right, good afternoon. Uh, I'll start with the uh, rounds report, and then, we'll, as always, we'll get into some updates. Uh, December, looking at that month alone, as you all know, it was extremely cold. We had several days of zero rounds of golf because it never got above freezing. Um, even with that being said, we, we ended the year at just under 175,000 rounds of golf. Um, last year, we ended at 177,000, so we only had about a 2,000 round drop, and that was basically with November and December being a wash. Um, so the good news in that was we were so far ahead going into those two months that we still almost ended up even. Um, one thing I want to mention in January, it's we've started off a little better, had some better days. Just in the last three days, we've had over 1,000 rounds, um, over 2,000 for the month. Um, last year at this point, we were at about 450. So uh, we're, we're making up that ground. So we just need weather, as I say all the time. Um, and in December, we lost 5,000 rounds compared to last year. So there, yeah, I guess the weather was, was really good. Um, car rentals, we ended up almost dead even. We were about $5,000 ahead of last year. Again, that's taken into account that we didn't really have much revenue at all in November and December. So I'm um, happy with that. Um, food and beverage, we ended up $150,000 above last year. Um, this area, again, that I've, I've said all along that I think has the most room for improvement. Um, going back to the event rentals just this weekend, we had six inquiries for uh, rentals, uh, mainly Auburn Hills right now, until we get the renovations complete. Um, but as we're just picking up momentum every week we get, we went from one inquiry every two weeks to two a week to four a week to now six to 10 a week. Um, and that just continues to grow. So. Um, I think next year, food and beverage, and I want to commend Kevin Bishop, our food and beverage manager. He's not here right now, but he, uh, he's done a great job and is really putting all the pieces in place to be successful there next year. Uh, monthly membership, or the memberships, we did go up a little bit over November. We gained about seven members, which this time of year, that's any increase is good. It doesn't really make a lot of sense to get a membership when you're probably not going to use it for the next three months, but um, we are going back up and I expect a huge increase uh, come spring. Uh, driving range is pretty much flat year over year. Um, again, that's uh, an area that we have six of us that are going to Orlando at the end of this month to the PGA show and uh, just to look at all the new products and technology and all everything um, in the golf industry and the driving range improvements is, is one area I really want to take away. Uh, from that experience. Uh, merchandise, we were up $120,000 over last year. Um, every course other than really the McDonald um, Im improved significantly. Um, and then with Mac, we Keith is, is retiring uh, February 17th, so he just didn't really bring in a ton of inventory for that reason. Um, so again, we've got when we have the weather, we have all the people there. Now we're just looking to really build all that supplemental revenue um, through all the food and beverage, through the revenue, the retail side. Um, and the, the pieces, I feel really good because I feel like they are coming together. Um, since I've started, it's, it's kind of been a lot of planning and laying the groundwork to really kick off the 23 season um, with everything in place. And we're, we're it's, it's all really starting to come together. So. Um, before I go any farther, are there any further are there any questions on the round report? No, thank you. Good. Okay. Um, so, again, going into 2023, I think we have a, a ton of momentum. Um, 
a, a lot of planning and now it's time to put these plans, execute these plans and, and put them in place. Um, just tomorrow I'm, I'm doing the customer service training. Um, I planned that six weeks ago for January 10th, thinking, you know, it'll be freezing, won't be a problem to get all the staff together. It's going to be 65 degrees and sunny tomorrow. So uh, I'm going to leave some staff at each course so we can take care of all the golfers and then I'll add a second training for all the staff so everyone gets to go through that training. Um, that is kind of the kickoff for me for a customer service initiative. I mean, I, I really want to put a huge focus on that this year, and this, this training will be the kind of the kickoff for that. Um, all of the projects and all the other things that we're ready to go with, um, a big part of that was getting the Golf Board of Governors in place, and we finally had our first meeting last Wednesday. Um, I'm happy to report that it was, I felt like it was a very successful meeting. Um, we, it's a great group of folks that were very engaged and I think will really help move forward with the progress that we're trying to make. Um, we have the next meeting on January 17th, so it'll be every, it'll be the third Tuesday of each month at four o'clock. Um, so we've got the, the next meeting two weeks after the first, so we can just dive in and then go and it's in this room, in this room. So any, any questions? Questions for staff? Um, I, 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 like I said, I, I watched some of that video. I was very, um, a couple of things I wanted to point out. I, I think that the, uh, the branding work that's being done on the courses mm -hmm. I think is very exciting and I'm very interested to see how that progresses. I think some of the renderings that have been put forward are very exciting. I think again, um, really interesting ideas being put forward in, in terms of food and beverage. Um, so I'm really excited, like some of the discussions that I was hearing that was getting me really excited was hopefully there, this, especially Auburn Hills can be a draw for folks who may not be interested in playing golf and they just want a great place to eat because the menu is so good. Um, so I'm really excited to see the work that's going on. Also the, uh, the canned alcohol discussion was pretty neat. So I mean like I, that, that's, uh, that's, I don't know, I'm sorry, I'm getting, it was a great idea. There was this, there, this canned, um, it's, it's a new liquor license uh, solution that you've got. I right. think that will be very interesting for food and beverage as well. Right, yeah, and as I say, it's been a lot of planning. So we've, certain events, we've tried out different things and, and Kevin with the, the food and beverage manager, he's really tried to target these different events where we've had big groups to see what worked and what, what didn't work. and. Uh, Honestly, just about everything has worked according to everyone so far. So I think everyone's just excited to see more offerings on um, the food and beverage side. And I mean, our golfers, 175,000 rounds, we've got a lot of people there, but there's no reason why we can't, as just like you just said, bring people in just to eat. Um, I mean, Auburn is the obvious, but all of the courses, once we get the renovations, I think we can, and we can do, there's so many different non-golf events at night that we can do with bingo nights, trivia nights, all these type of things to bring in, to, to offer something else to our, our customers and bring in more revenue. And, and the, the one thing that the metric I thought was really exciting and interesting was the kind of change of the, of the mindset from just the, num the hard numbers to what's the revenue per visitor say? Like how is it like, and I was curious if there's any kind of. Yeah, I feel like, you know, you know I've been in the private side and then on the, you know, in the government side and on the private side it's all about revenue mm -hmm. that's that's what you have to have on this side we have an obligation to our our community to to provide, to provide these services so we want to make sure they're utilizing our facilities so that rounds is more important here than on the private side um, but since we are enterprise fund we have to have revenue otherwise we we don't we don't operate so i'm um, trying to find walk that line and figure out how to come up with both um, and it's fun it's a fun challenge so. thank you very much do we have any other questions or comments Okay. All right. Thank you very much, Jesse. Thank really you. appreciate it. Okay. All right. Park maintenance and forestry. I think uh, Brett is going to be giving us a presentation. Yeah, so my name is Brett Russell. I'm a general maintenance supervisor over the smallest section in park forestry and maintenance, the construction and special projects section. Uh, so I'm not as familiar with the forestry and the park maintenance, but the construction and special projects I'm a little bit more familiar with. Uh, but obviously, you know, winter months are, are often times for us to uh, get things done uh, that 
that we can't when we're just running so fast during the spring, summer, and fall months. Um, but that having been said, with the weather we've had, uh, December has still been a very, very busy month uh, for, for all of us. And so th these are the numbers that Gary has provided for the forestry section, uh, really giving us an idea of what they've been doing in the way of their uh, production and accomplishment numbers for uh, tree removals, pruning, inspections, and so forth. So you'll see that their tree removal number there for December was at 305. And then obviously they had a, a, a lot of emergency response, 107 emergency responses uh, throughout the month, likely due to the, some of the weather that we experienced throughout the month of December. And then the inspection number obviously is pretty high too. Uh, a lot to, uh, to, of reports and requests to investigate, see what needs to be done. So a very busy month. As far as support activity goes uh, for uh, forestry section, um, they're continuing obviously constantly with the lucidity maintenance. Uh, that's it's ongoing. It's a learning process. It's a big tool, and so getting people trained and up to speed on its use is is indeed an ongoing ongoing process. You'll notice that they had uh, zero uh, large log halls uh, throughout the month of December and the explanation provided for that is that really both of their knuckle boom trucks were down uh, during the month of December. That's the primary tool they use to haul those large logs. Now this doesn't mean that they didn't do any large log hauls. It, they're just not tracked uh, as, as such because they've had to resort to other methods. Uh, so they were making use of flatbed trucks uh, flatbed trucks haul about a third of what their knuckle boom trucks will haul in the way of large logs. Uh, so uh, the work was being done, it was just done in different ways. They augmented some of that with additional chipping and so forth rather than actually using the knuckle boom truck. Uh, Gary does report that this one of the knuckle booms is back up uh, and functional already early this month. So obviously that activity is going to resume, but the grapple saw, as you know here, is, is down for repair as well. So those are uh, big tools for them and for their productivity. And so when they're down, it, it really makes it difficult for them to, uh, to take care of everything that needs to be done. And then of course, you know, they've got 23 vacant positions still open uh, to fill. So filling those is something that would uh, certainly produce or, or increase their production numbers. And then they're getting ready for the uh, tree planting process uh, throughout this winter, having received uh, some of the uh, burlap and bald trees uh, for, for planting. And so for, for January, obviously, they're keeping time open for those emergency responses, inspection works, uh, inspection work, but then they're also uh, uh, pre preparing for that winter, winter planting that's going to go on. Those guys stay extremely busy trying to get trees in the ground and staked and, and, and so forth. And then, of course, they assist with all of the light removals from the winter decorations that have been up uh, throughout the month of December. Uh, for construction and special projects for this, for December, uh, we completed a couple of more uh, memorial bench installations. We've got some more of those to do, uh, but we, create, we uh, completed a couple of those in College Hill Park. Um, we were able to fill one vacant position. I have a total of, of eight. Um, filling this position put me up to seven full-time employees, so I still have a labor supervisor position, a key position that's open for us, and uh, hopefully we'll get to fill that at some sometime here in the, in the near future. There were some programming thing concerns with the, the season's venue, having to have the main gate open at Watson Park to allow people to get to the venue, created some access issues for the rest of the park. Uh, so the venue would be open at times when the rest of the park was not. And so we, we as, as kind of a temporary measure here, we uh, fabricated some um, cable gate posts. It's a fairly wide drive at that point, so we had to go with some steel posts. Um, and then we installed a cable gate. That way they can keep that eastern side of the park closed while still allowing access for uh, those who have rented the season's venue. We did some fence repair along Zoo Boulevard. Um, there was a cable gate that was run throughout a Pawnee Prairie by a vehicle. We, we put that all back, back together. And then there's a lot of signage work, particularly in Pawnee Prairie. That's, that's ongoing, it seems like. Uh, People don't like our signs talking about bicycles, regardless of what we do. 
Um, and then we had graffiti removal that's ongoing for us as well. Um, we did respond to the snow and ice event that we had on December 22nd and 23rd with our snow removal crews uh, performing that service in 33 different parking lots. That's not as high as we normally get, but we had our primary equipment, a large dump truck with a spreader and plow that had a, a fuel pressure issue and was down for us during that event. We couldn't operate that. We had recently invested in a, a small spreader and plow for our mini dump, and that's what got us by through this event. We hadn't had that previously. We'd have been probably in real trouble uh, without that. So the fact that we were able to secure that just late last year, uh, the timing was, was, was really good. We were able to use it for this snow event, and it allowed us to hit at least the high points uh, for most of these facilities so that they could continue to, f to function. We had a break in at our storage facility out at Pawnee Prairie. Uh, so we had to re report out there and clean that up. A lot of the items that were stored in the building got hauled outside the building, made a temporary little space of some kind that they were that they were hanging out in. So we, we had to we had to clean that all up and resecure that that building. On our playground front, we were able to get a couple of events that had been pulled out of service, put back into service. Our lead times on some of these things have been as much as a year and a half. Uh, so it was very nice to get uh, some of these in, in, and so some of the improvements there in Central Riverside as well as Herman Hill. And then that crew of two also completed uh, 300 playground safety inspections throughout the month of December. We assisted some other uh, folks as well with some of the services that we provided. Uh, Chester I. Lewis Park reopened. Uh, the fence that had originally been provided by the contractor was a responsibility for that was assumed by the park department, so we, we helped us, uh, with taking that down, removing that, and, and returning it uh, to the vendor. We supported the Winter Wonderland event there in NASCAR Park. Um, one of the rec centers received some new chairs, chair racks. We received that delivery at our park maintenance shop, transferred the materials there, assembled the chair racks, uh, and delivered the chairs so that they were there for use for their new events. And I think the old chairs went to uh, Watson Park so the old chairs are still getting used but the new ones are now in place there at the rec center and then just some other minor vandalism some other things that we did to to support rec in various things so for January we're looking to finish up at least one if not two more of our memorial benches one of them is pretty deep in Chisholm Creek Park and with the winter weather we haven't been able to get a, a concrete uh, vehicle back in there but we were checking it out again today hopefully we'll be able to get to that in the next few days. As you can see, we've got some new um, players benches going in at the Robert Thurman Field there in McAdams Park. Uh, I think we actually may have wrapped that up today. I'll touch base with the crew tomorrow to make sure there's not any loose ends, but we installed three of those 16-foot uh, player benches in each of the dugouts there at Robert Thurman Field. So with the renovations that we did last year, this is, makes this a, a really nice facility some nice improvements for the uh, teams and leagues that make use of that facility. Um, we've got the repair of the Opportunity Fence Drive. Uh, we actually, I think, finished that late last week as well. And then we'll just continue, you know, our playground safety inspections, responding to graffiti and vandalism. And if we get any more snow and ice, we'll respond to that as well. So that leaves the park maintenance section of the division. And those are the guys that do all the work with the landscape beds, the planting, the gardening. Uh, they also deal with all of the homeless uh, cleanup, illegal dumping r removal, and things of that nature. And then, of course, throughout the, the latter part of the month there and starting into January, they began removing all again those, uh, those uh, winter decorations that have been up in the, in the various parks. Uh, so they're currently working on, like, leaf removal and mulching, uh, trimming back, or cutting back the, the, the native grasses, things of that nature. And so that's what you kind of see depicted in, in some of these uh, visuals here. And then uh, the, the well reports for NPDES that are being done. Uh, they also had multiple days of ice and snow removal where they had to make sure the walks and so forth leading to the rec centers were, um, were, were passable. And then they're working on some uh, noxious weed work as well. This kind of captures some of what these guys do that's so difficult. Uh, the homeless encampment cleanups, the, the legal dumping that just seems to be an ongoing, an ongoing problem here. But they kind of break down some of the uh, activity here from 2022 for us. It's pretty interesting. So in 2022, they had that outsourced vendor 
that they, uh, they called upon to clear 76 different locations. You see the cost there, about $76,000, so averaging right around $1,000 a cleanup uh, there. And then with internal staff, they were able to clear some 66 homeless camps, 317 labor hours at a cost of just about $7,000. And then I know in talking uh, with them too, uh, they kind of compared their numbers of that $1,000 a camp uh, on this outsource vendor cost with what WPD was experiencing. And their number was coming in actually just a little bit higher per cleanup, closer to around $1,200 a cleanup. Uh, so um, obviously it's, a, it's an ongoing problem. Having that outsource vendor uh, reduced the, the amount of time that internal staff were having to work on on uh, those cleanups of those homeless camps. And so in the meantime, when they're not dealing with those things, again, they're working on their winter list of work. Uh, as time and conditions allow, they'll do some mowing of fire guards in the various parks, removing eastern red cedars and so forth, and trimming back ornamental grasses and removing shrubs, cleaning those up, etc. cetera. I think that's, uh, I think that's it for Park maintenance, park maintenance and forestry. So, any right. questions? Thank you very much. Any questions for staff? Okay. Right. Seeing none. Troy, anything you'd like to add? There's a lot that they do. It's it's incredible amount of work that they do. Yes. So yeah, and continually adding to additional tasks, but. Um, everything from installing benches to now we're going to be moving the Santa house over at Nasca Park. So just all these little things always seem to fall in our lap. All right. Yep. Okay. Going to move forward. I don't believe we have an update from the Parks Foundation, and that leaves the President's update. i uh, just like to remind everybody uh, the word of the day is trees. So again, uh, it's always the word of the day, uh, but that's okay. So that's the only update I've got. Uh, Troy, do you have any uh, thoughts you'd like to share? Yeah, there's a couple. Uh, going back to the Park Foundation update, um, there's a partnership that we've done to install kayaks at three different locations with a, uh, a third party operator. And um, Katie finalized the uh, contract and we're hoping to install total of 12 kayaks in locations where people can rent them. It's going to be very similar to renting a bicycle. You could just download the app and you put your credit card number in there and you can uh, get a code to open up the cage and then you open up the cage, you take out the kayak and go have fun for a couple hours. You bring it back and you get charged for the time that you use. So um, three different locations. One of them is going to be OJ Watson. One of them is going to be over by the tennis center so they can have access to the small Arkansas River. And then one is going to be over by the um, Kellogg overpass by Gander Mountain, mm -hmm. the old Gander Mountain, uh, so they can have access to the, uh, the Arkansas River. So we're pretty excited about that. Uh, it's a five-year um, agreement. And there was, a, I think it was $42,000 was our investment. And we're hoping to get that paid back within two or three years, and then the rest of it becomes revenue going back to the park board. I'm sorry, to the park foundation. Wait, so in user fees, you expect to uh, return that in two years, you say? Two to three years. Oh, wow. Okay. That's yep. great. Yep. Um, and just out of curiosity, would that be going actually toward the boathouse? When you say by Gander Mountain, we do have a boathouse there. I don't know if it's ever used for boat purposes at this point. but So the boathouse is actually operated by a third party to... Uh, do rentals, uh, and there's also the uh, Kansas Sports Hall of Fame on the on the first floor. Right. It's really kind of a cool location. Um, we actually get to use that building a few times for our meetings once in a while, um, but we don't manage it, we don't operate it, we gotcha. don't put money into it. So, Fair. and then a uh, couple other things to do as well. Um, in three weeks, we're going to be going to our state conference. Councilmember Bluebell won an award. Uh, we won an award with the Salvation Army as a partnership. Uh, Matt Martinez, he won an award, a very prestigious award through recreation for all of his work as a recreation supervisor. And then if you recall, I was, I, I won an award as well. So, um, 
So yeah, that's going to be in a couple, two, three weeks, and a lot of our staff is going to be going, and we're pretty excited about that. Botanica, we're right now in the process of uh, recruiting a executive director for Botanica. They had a pretty great uh, season for illuminations. They've had a couple days where it was really too cold to open up, but I think uh, from what I heard, they'd had a really good turnout, and things are going really well with Botanica, but um, hopefully within two or three months, we'll have a new executive director. So, um, Tomorrow, we're going to, uh, to council on CLAP uh, for the contract for design. So as, as you recall, two or three years ago, we created a master plan. Um, we didn't have money allocated until 2023, so now it's 2023. We're allocating the money to, to finish the design. So from master plan to design, and that's all the way through construction management. Um, and the really big items are obviously the inclusive playground that we keep talking about, dog park, um, improving the, the trails and the bridges, re repairing the bridges, and just some general upkeep and care for the rest of the park. So we have $2.5 million in 23 and another $2.5 million in 24. So we're going to be using all that money for those activities. So we'll be going to council tomorrow for that. We have the green light on the pickleball complex to start um, finalizing the design. We had some pretty uh, interesting conversations about the floor plan for the, uh, the building, the support building that's going to be out there. Um, to have restrooms, uh, point of sale, um, gathering place, and then all the pickleball courts. Um, we have we had $3 million, $2 million, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, let me go back. We had $3 million for the project, $300,000 is tied up in the design right now. And it's looking like it, we're going to need more money uh, to finish the project. So uh, as we move forward with finalizing some of the design, our folks that are doing this work, they're going to actually go out and try to find some soft costs or, or not necessarily soft costs, that's not the right terminology. Try to find some ballpark costs of what it's going to cost us so we can see where we need to go after that. So um, that project is moving forward. Brewer Recreation Center is moving forward as well. Um, we have some issues that uh, the building is in the flood zone and we had to do some changes and modifications and so we're working on that. Chester I. Lewis Park is open. We removed the fencing, and uh, we're anticipating the art to be installed at the end of the spring or throughout the summer. And then we'll have a, a really good ribbon cutting for that. So, Very good. Yep. OK. Anybody else have any questions or comments for the go to the body or just have nowhere else to go? Trees. Trees. Trees, Trees it is. OK. And with that, I'll make a motion uh, that we adjourn. <coughs> Do I have a second? second. Uh, it's seconded by Vice Chair Cabral. All those in favor, please vote aye. Aye. All those opposed? Uh, the ayes have it. We are adjourned. Thank you very much.